Hey everyone, this is Andy, better known as Love Retro BTW on Twitter X, Threads, IG, and Cafe BTW on TikTok and YouTube. A quick update that the Cafe BTW podcast is taking a very long hiatus, but I still have something really amazing to share with you. We have a fantastic retro gaming community on Twitter X, where we've crossed well over 2,000 passionate members. And if you're a lover of retro gaming, this is the perfect place to share your content, showcase your pickups, or just chat about your favorite old school games. To dive into nostalgia and become a part of the thriving community, click in the show notes on the Cafe BTW link tree, or go right to my Twitter X profile on Love Retro BTW. And now, without further ado, gear up for another sensational episode of the Gamers Week Podcast. This time on Gamers Week Podcast. Yeah, I, I wonder what else you could plug Pi into. That would be fun. A different game might yield, obviously, different results. So I, I wonder if this is going to become a thing. All of a sudden, all of these Twitch channels are going to pop up where it's, you know... Pi plays uh, Bubble Bath Babes or something like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> if Pi played Bubble Bath Babes, there would be a headline that said, Nerds still cannot see t- <laughs> <laughs> So what dish are you guys usually responsible for cooking for your family Thanksgivings? Ooh, that's a good question. The one thing that I do almost every year is Thanksgiving egg rolls. Thanksgiving egg rolls. Okay. Yes. So it's stuffing, it's turkey, and it's kind of some of the vegetables and stuff all rolled up into an egg roll. And then I give plum dipping sauce. That sounds good, actually. Do you do that with the leftovers or? No, no. I just, I go to the store and pick up like a already cooked turkey. Oh, okay. So I was like, so you cook a whole Thanksgiving dinner just to (laughs) chop it up and make egg rolls. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Just throw it all into like a food processor and then, yeah. Okay. What you could do is make it a fun game and make like a whole bunch of those egg rolls and one cat food egg roll. <laughs> <laughs> and note to self, I'm not coming to Thanksgiving at Donnie's house. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. I just think it's fun. <laughs> uh huh. Of course, you tell everybody you wouldn't do that as you pass out the egg rolls. <laughs> They're just sitting there wondering, like, is this is this going to happen? Am I going to bite into some nine lives or some tender vittles or whatever it is? <laughs> Over at our house, we only use fancy fees. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Welcome to Gamers Week podcast. Like the name says, we analyze the best, worst, and weirdest headlines of the past week in the video game industry. This is episode 98, and today is Wednesday, November 15th, 2023. Thanks so much for tuning in, everyone. My name is Blue Williams, and I'll be your host for this evening, but I am not alone. As usual, I do have my two fine co-hosts with me. Please pass the milk to my first co-host, who has recently gone public with his fetish for cereal mascots. <laughs> <laughs> and my second co-host is currently attending meetings at the Yes, I Beat Shang Long Anonymous. Ah, you called me out that, huh? <laughs> Call me out. Please, everyone, say hello to Ryan Payne, a.k.a. Retro Game Brews, and the one and only Donnie G. If I'm into Tony the Tiger, does that make me a furry? <laughs> you know, we don't kink shame. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Who are you dressing up as to entice Tony the Tiger? Ooh, that's a good question. I'll get back to you on that because that, that okay. takes, that's a little bit of unpacking <laughs> that needs to be done. <laughs> and in my defense, I only said that once on the school ground to, to seem cool. <laughs> I came clean. I came clean. <laughs> All right. So just a heads up, next week is Thanksgiving here in the U.S. So we will be taking the week off for the holiday and regularly scheduled programming will resume on Friday, December 1st. 
Let's go ahead and get this show started with our reviews, reactions, and requests. At Pathfinder Cast says, My guess is the Legend of Zelda movie will be a clone of the Prince of Persia movies. They may even be bold enough to cast Jake Gyllenhaal as Link, <laughs> and it will make hundreds of millions of dollars. I would watch it. I like the Prince of Persia movies. Please no. That's a bold choice. <laughs> Add back a wheel says, Retro Game Brews, your story of playing X-Men brings me back. You said you could barely see over the controls. I remember the arcade having a stool I used to stand on to play games like Golden Axe, Simpsons, Turtles in Time, and X-Men. Oh, memories of the stool. Absolutely. Memories <laughs> back of when you were short, which was a long time ago. It was. Yeah, it was quite a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> And at EmoS said, Haley may have been last week's dead fish, but she has nothing on AI Donnie. <laughs> Not all of my parallel universe Donnie G retros are um, as lively as I am. It's like that movie Multiplicity. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> she touched my peppy, she Steve. touched my peppy, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's time for the... Ah, another wonderful day in Gamers Weekland. Uh, oh no, I almost forgot to vote in this week's very important poll. I better head down to the polling place and cast my ballot. I wonder what wacky questions they'll ask this week. If it sucks, it's probably Donnie's question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we are. Oh man, this line is long. Hope I can cast my vote before the polling place closes. I am uh, I'm RGB. What's your name? I'm Frank Dukes. Oh, nice to meet you, Dukes. Uh, aren't you a little young to be voting? Aren't you a little old for video games? <laughs> Funny. Oh, who's this guy? <laughs> Invitation, please. Oh, oh, I didn't know I needed one. Um, all I have with me is the Gamers Week butt plug. Will that work? We honor your invitation. No sh you honor his invitation. <laughs> you want to know where I'm from? Uh, USA? Okay, USA. What's my name? I, I, don't, I don't know if I should tell you. Damn! Stop! Stop! Fine, I'm RGB. I'm one of the hosts of the Gamers Week podcast. Can I go vote now? You are next. A little aggressive, but thanks. <laughs> well, finally got my vote in. Thanks, pals. I ate your pal face. Wow. You really must be from Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> the cut of blood sport we never thought we needed. <laughs> uh, admittedly, I watched blood sport recently. It was on my mind and I was like, there's so many little things I could pull out here to try to make a story. So there you go. Oh, that's great, man. <laughs> well done. I would not have thought of doing that. Good job. It just started with you are next. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So every Monday on Twitter, we post our VIP or very important poll. If you'd like to participate, follow us on Twitter at Gamers Week PC. Now, the question for this week is what video game character has the worst job? Coming in third place was Night City Police Department police officer from Cyberpunk 2077 with 5% of the vote. In second place was the Night Guard from Five Nights at Freddy's with 14.9% of the vote and crushing it this week, ironically is the Goomba from Super Mario Brothers with 63.6% .6 of the votes. Now, 16.5% of you said other, so let's look at some of the comments from the poll. At JDragon272 said, Peter Pepper from Burger Time. He's constantly being chased by a live food ingredients. Mr. Hot Dog, Mr. Pickle, Mr. Egg, later Mr. Donut. They want to eat him, and he's just simply doing his job and of making burgers for his customers. I don't like getting chased by Mr. Pickle. <laughs> <laughs> or Mr. Hot Dog for that matter You think Mr. Pickle and Mr. Donut would, would be friends <laughs> Oh god <Team> <laughs> That's a bad tag team <laughs> At Queen Quan 93 said Whoever cleans the area up after every match in Mortal Kombat At Alienated Youth says The poor pot makers in the Zelda series Their hard work constantly getting wrecked by some punk All the way through the generations at Nukitako said, the overseer of Vault 11, Fallout New Vegas, the vault dwellers elect a new overseer every year, and at the end of their term, they are sacrificed. 
And last up from Retro Blast US, Face McShooty in Borderlands. He literally only exists for you to shoot him in the face. <laughs> oh, that's bad. <laughs> so taking a look at this week's poll, Donnie, what are you going with? I knew you were going to start with me. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> I did make a comment, though, about the Goomba. Does, is he actually making money while employed for Bowser? Does he Does he got a, a W-2 or an I-9? Is, does he pay taxes? Does he get paid to get stomped on? I think he does. He's got a really good 401k plan. They match up to 15%. Bowser is, he's an evil guy, but he also is really, really employee centric. So uh, 15% <laughs> in the 401k, you say? <laughs> I did. So you may want to become a Goomba. I mean, I heard the life expectancy isn't great, but also they will pay for uh, half of the uh, life insurance policy as well. So you could just up that up and uh, your family be all set, but. Then I'm going to say the Goomba is probably not the worst job. You might, I mean, <laughs> you, you, get a, you get a headache here and there, but the, the perks and the benefits are really good. All right, Blue, what is your choice? I'm going to go with anybody who has a job in Raccoon City. Uh. Ooh. I don't think it really matters what the job is, but just, of course, being in proximity to the Umbrella Corporation, whether you actually work for them or you work at the cafe down the corner or however it, it looks, whatever your job is in Raccoon City, you're uh, you're probably not going to need to put in your two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be staying there um, permanently. That's, I, that's the kind of job security I'm looking for. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's not a good work-life balance. They really demand 100% dedication <laughs> to Umbrella Corp. And everything's a lateral move. No raising. <laughs> <laughs> yep. What about you, Ryan? I think anybody who has to work for the great and mighty Pooh from uh, Conker's Bad Fur Day. <laughs> I can't imagine the smell is great. Um, oh. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and then I would imagine you have to like clean up after him because the guy's kind of in one place all the time. So you probably have to go shop for him, get him food, bring him back, all that good stuff. And so I just can't imagine that being a, uh, a workplace I would want to get up in the, you know, the beginning of the day and head on to. So, yeah, my choice is uh, the employees of the great and mighty Pooh. <laughs> you have to shop for Pooh. <laughs> I didn't have that on my bingo card. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to our patron shout outs. We couldn't do what we do without the help of our gorgeous patrons. Here are the generous folks supporting Gamers Week on Patreon. Wizard of Zardoz, Bobson Dugnut, Loudmoth, Retro Blast Pat, Great Siaman 81, BNT Zilla Guy, The Mad Milkman, Johnny Boombots, Seven Castle Forest, Crunchy Kong, Sheriff Snacks, Frank Grande, Love Retro BTW, Steven Sand, Ramboski, Terry Kinnair, Doongie Forever, Ducks in Disguise, Don't Make Me Pull Over This Car, Games with Coffee, Hybrid Divide, Matto1606, You Fall Before Me, Davey PGH, The Redox PDX Family, including Shannon and Luke, Shalazil, Zach Huge Thanks, Number One Blue Sick Boys Fan, Sassy Sony, Evil Lust, Rai Rai's Secret Best Friend, Mega Retro Man, Gamma Troid, Michael Lakite, Emo Esque, Bill Tucker, The Real Retro Game Brews, Fruitcakes Pickled Pepper, and Ducks with Thick Thighs. If you like what you hear today, and we really hope you do, please consider joining us on Patreon. Your support helps cover the cost of producing the show, as well as the other cool stuff we'll be doing, like prizes and giveaways. You'll also gain access to our weekly patron-only bonus cast called Gamers Week Uncut, Patrons with Benefits. Visit patreon.com slash gamersweek, or follow the link in the show notes to learn more. And I almost started that off like Evan Baxter from Bruce Almighty. <laughs> That's what got me laughing. I think you should have done it. <laughs> well, maybe next time. All right, let's move on to our headline segment. And our headlines are proudly sponsored by the Retro Game Club podcast. It's a fantastic, family-friendly retro gaming podcast. In each episode, Rob and Hugh pick two games to play and discuss, as well as news, interviews, and other topics. Right now, they want to know, what are your favorite Falcom games? Send your answers to email at retrogameclub.net or follow the link in the show notes. So what's interesting about Falcom is I think that for the most part, they made games for Japan and very mm -hmm. few ever made it to North America. I know they made the Ease uh, series. So Ease is, uh, of course, mm -hmm. an RPG. So a lot of people are familiar with that. 
Uh, but the one that I have the most experience with probably is the legacy of the wizard, uh, right. which oh, yeah. is a super hard and frustrating NES game because you can get soft locked so easily with that game. But I recently, well, not recently, a few years ago, I watched uh, streamer Hungry Gorilla go through it. And she's a big fan. So to watch somebody who actually knows how to play it, too, was was interesting. And then I went back and played it myself. Got through it. But man, that is an unforgiving game. It is NES hard, as they say. Yeah, that, that's as hard as they come. Katie? <laughs> it's harder than Triceratops turds. <laughs> <laughs> All right, first up from Eurogamer, Sony confirms delay to half of its planned live service games. Sony has half the number of live service games it plans to release by March of 2026, from 12 to 6. Back in 2022, Sony stated that it aimed to launch over 10 new live service games. The news came days after it acquired Destiny developer Bungie. Now, however, it seems plans have been scaled back to ensure each live service game's quality as Sony president, COO, and CFO Hiroki Totoki explained on a call discussing the company's latest financial results. We are reviewing this. We are trying as much as possible to ensure these games are enjoyed and liked by gamers for a long time, said Totoki. Of the 12 titles, six titles will be released by fiscal year 25. That's our current plan. As for the remaining six titles, we're still working on that. One of those 12 games is Naughty Dog's The Last of Us multiplayer game, which is still in development but needs more time, according to reports from May. Development has slowed following the Bungie acquisition, with the studio raising concerns about the game. At the release of Sony PlayStation Plus subscription service, PlayStation boss Jim Ryan stated that his belief live service games were the future. The phenomenon of live service games that has a very large part fueled the enormous growth in the gaming industry that we've seen over the last 10 years, he said at the time. I think that the trend towards the live service games will continue. And if you look for a model in our category of entertainment, which supports sustained engagement over a long period of time, live service games arguably fit the bill better than a subscription service. Reports from September have since suggested Sony's pivot to live service games may not pay off the way Jim Ryan had once hoped. Ryan is set to retire from Sony in March. By contrast, yesterday, Warner Brothers CEO David Zaslav said during his latest earning call, the company would focus on live service games. Our focus is transforming our biggest franchises from large console and PC based with three or four year release schedules to include more always on gameplay through live service games, multi-platform and free to play extensions with the goal to have more players spending more time on more platforms, he said. Oh, no, not the live service games going away. <laughs> oh, I'm so disappointed. Oh, Please no. stop. So by definition, live service game is a game that sees a constant stream of new content added post launch and is purposefully designed to keep you playing years after launch, meaning it's purposefully designed to keep taking money out of your wallet post-launch. Right, especially if they can either be free-to-play with heavy monetization strategies like mm -hmm. a uh, Warzone or something like, like a Battle Pass kind of a thing. Which I hate. I absolutely detest Battle Passes. There's, I mean, skins and all this stuff. It, it doesn't really do anything for me. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're releasing playable content for a specific game, I think that's enough to justify this, to, to scale these titles back and make sure that your these games are really going to be home run hitters uh, that you put out that's going to keep people that's going to want to have them coming back and continue to play this game for a while. But just don't don't fill it up with battle passes. And all this other crap that's so useless and pointless. I don't care about a skin. I really don't. So ideally, you would like the model for like Mario Kart 8, where you're releasing new maps every couple of months, if you will, into perpetuity. I like that, actually. And mm -hmm. it wasn't, I don't say in perpetuity, because there's going to be a point, I guess, where you want something new. I think one of the fallacies, though, is that with these live service games, People are going to be willing to play a game for that long and that consistently over time. Even smash hits like World of Warcraft, even though there is still, still definitely a community of people who play it, it's mm -hmm. probably not raking in the same amount of cash that it once did for Blizzard. True, but I don't see that as a fallacy. 
I, I get what Brian's saying in that everybody wants a live service game, but to, to get the kind of live service game to be the kind of moneymaker they want, like they want that to be your game. Like you pick right. one game and that's your game, whether yeah. it's Warzone, whether it's Diablo, World of Warcraft, Destiny, whatever your game was. And I think it's really telling that they announced these 12 live service games when they acquired Bungie. And then just a few weeks ago, we were talking about how Bungie's kind of struggling as of late because the Destiny formula that was so hot that everybody wanted, it's kind of fizzled out. It was hot and then it fizzled out. And I feel like for most live service games, with a few exceptions, that's just kind of what you can expect because to be able to maintain player interest for years and years and years, that's just not feasible, especially when, like just looking at Sony and nobody else, if they're going to put out 12 live service games, eventually six to start with and the other six are kind of in limbo. But even if just the six, they're going to put out six live service games. They want you to play them all, but there's no way you can. Of course. So almost to put out that many is is defeating yourself in a way. You're you're saturating the market. Right. And you know what? One of the, I think the biggest crux of the live service games is that you need um, a certain amount of volume of players playing it at every given moment. Uh, so right. if your game starts to trail off and it takes a while for you to get matchmaking done, that's that kills it. Nobody's going to want to play it if everybody is waiting even more than 30 seconds for a match to come up. That's that's seems like an eternity. I remember, you know, uh, of course, being big into StarCraft and then going back and trying to play it and waiting like 20 minutes for somebody to be like, hey, I want to play with you. Like, <laughs> no, <laughs> that was awful. nobody got time for that. Yeah, right. Exactly. And I mean, it's not, of course, to that degree, but you, you need a certain volume of players in order to maintain the the player base at, at the end of the day. So as that starts dropping off, more and more people are going to jump ship. Sure, you can go over to the next live service game, but if you're releasing them all at the same time. <laughs> I Now, I will argue, I, I will agree with you on that point. Like, yeah. maybe don't release them all at the same time. Maybe release them in uh, increments. You know, every three months you release one or, or what have you. But I'm tending to disagree with both of you on one point, is the okay. fact that, yes, when, when player excitement for your game is kind of dwindling down, that's the perfect opportunity to release something new, release new content that's going to keep them rejuvenated and 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 make them feel refreshed for the game. Sometimes it's a home run. Sometimes it's a it's a strikeout. As with you know Destiny Two, I think a game like Dead by Daylight does that pretty well. Absolutely, to a certain extent. You know, after a while, that kind of gets old. With um, yeah, you know the maps are the maps are new. Uh, it's great. The killers are new. That's great. But it's the same thing over and over and over again. Right. Right. It's like maybe uh, at some point when that starts to wane. Maybe a new mechanic being implemented would would probably be the refresh there as opposed to just another killer or another map. So you're saying like a, a new um let's so you know how like Fortnite has the the zombies thing and mm-hmm. you know, or save the world or whatever the hell it's called, adding yeah. a, a different style of gameplay for that that doesn't affect the 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 hardcore fans who are still in love with the old style of, you know, four survivors and one killer. But sure, there could be something like that. Yeah. But think about also with Fortnite and what they changed with you don't have to build. Uh, there was a mode that was like no building mode. And I think people went nuts for that because whenever I tried playing Fortnite, I, I wasn't the savant. I wasn't the the Zach Galifianakis sitting there at the blackjack table with all the numbers running through my head, trying to build up a 40 foot tower in just like two seconds and being able to edit that tower and all that stuff while switching back and forth between guns and stuff. I'm just like, I'm old. I just want to shoot people. And that's it. <laughs> Where's all the pew pew. <laughs> exactly. I don't want to build stuff. I'm not Bob the builder. <laughs> but I mean, if, if we look at it though, I'm not surprised that, they're only coming out with six at this point. I'm starting to to believe or understand that live service games are kind of losing some of their luster amongst the average gamer player base. So it would have to be, I think, something truly unique, not yeah. your typical first person shooter, which is just so incredibly common. It, they become mm-hmm. commoditized at that point. 
Yeah. I really think that they're kind of running up against the same wall that streaming services are running up against too, where at first everybody thought, oh, if Netflix is so great. All we have to do is come up with our own streaming service and we'll make a gazillion dollars. And now everybody has one. And so right. your average consumer is going, well, I can't afford $10 for all of them. So I'm going to pick maybe two or three. And I feel like that's what's happening with live service games is that the market is just too saturated. And as you said, they're all too similar. And people are like, well, I'm going to stick with the ones that I know I like. Right. So personally, if I were Sony, I would say, let's pick our three that we feel like have the best solid idea. I wouldn't be messing around with 12 or even six. I would say, let's pick three. And I would make sure that I made those successful first, but before I was spreading my resources too thin. But... What do I know about running a multi-billion dollar company? (laughs) I just host a podcast. Next up from VGC, following Sonic movie success, Sega teases Persona and Yakuza adaptations. Sega has said it's keen to expand the reach of its biggest franchises beyond video games. In an interview with CNBC, Sega Chief Operating Officer Shuji Utsumi said the company wants to build on the success of Sonic's recent movie and TV outings by adapting some of its other IPs. We just revived Sonic in a big way, not only through games, but also movies and TV shows. And actually, Sonic is in Roblox too, and we're working closely now with LEGO. So now Sonic is reviving, he said. We have other major IPs, and also, I cannot say too much about it, but we are thinking of reviving other classical Sega IPs too. Sonic the Hedgehog hit cinemas in 2020 and grossed almost $320 million at the box office. Its sequel arrived last year and generated over $405 million. Sonic the Hedgehog 3 is scheduled for release in December 2024. Before then, a live-action TV series starring Knuckles and set between the second and third movies will be released. Right now, there are two big IPs other than Sonic, Utsumi said. One is Persona. We are introducing two Personas this year, and also our Yakuza title. I mean, Yakuza is really unique, but that big one is also coming next year, too. So be ready for like a dragon, infinite wealth. But also, as I say, we are trying to be in a lot of different kinds of businesses, additional areas, like Roblox and movies. All these IPs can be somewhere else other than games soon. Sega recently said that the development of its first super game is progressing steadily. Announced in May 2021, the Japanese publisher's super game project will span multiple AAA titles that cross over Sega's comprehensive range of technologies and go beyond the traditional framework of games, according to Itsumi. And I want to know, when is the Toe Jam and Earl movie coming? (laughs) (laughs) We did talk about that. I wonder if that ever went anywhere. I feel like they announced it, but then we never heard anything about scripts or anything like that. Right. Toe Jam and Earl? James Pond? (laughs) I was thinking like a Streets of Rage movie, though. Though, that would be amazing. Right. It looks like the Toe Jam and Earl movie was announced in December 2022. That's when we talked about it. And there has been nothing since. So surprise. That's good news. Okay. So would something like Night Trap, even though that's not a Sega property, would Night Trap work as a movie? Would Sewer Shark kind of work as a movie? If you if you had some some meat to that bone that we haven't already seen in the game itself? I would say Night Trap would work because it basically is a movie. (laughs) Yeah, true. And so is Sewer Shark to a point. Yeah, to a point. And there's kind of a hunger now for like cheesy retro stuff that I think if you did it right, you probably could make a successful movie out of it. I don't know, though. Does Sega really have the notoriety with the younger crowd that obviously Nintendo has? Like Sonic makes sense. Sonic's been a part. Of, I mean, Sonic's now on the Switch, so and he was on the Wii U and and before. So that's where I think some of that notoriety would come from. But I don't know if you're gonna get a bunch of seats or butts in the seat when it comes to James Pond movie. <laughs> no, that sounds but, terrible. But one of the things that okay, so Cyberpunk 2077 did that anime, which was Edge Runners. Sonic had an anime, right? Sonic had an anime. Why not do something like that? I mean, if you think about it, uh, like a Snatcher anime. Ooh. <laughs> right? right? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, That is a home run idea right there. Yes, but an anime adaptation that goes to Netflix or some other streaming services is always going to be a little bit more niche. And due to contracting, you're probably going to get a flat rate for it and maybe bonuses later, but... 
it's not going to have the same earning potential as a movie that they could put in a theater. And if they get lucky, it goes viral like Sonic right. did. Right. So that's what they're hoping to do. They're just hoping to make a heck of a lot more Sonics. <laughs> How do you clone a uh, blue hedgehog? <laughs> <laughs> right. And I, I think the reason why Sega is not as successful or synonymous with the younger crowd is, is you're right. They, they don't have a console of their own. Everybody right. knows Nintendo. Nintendo is still rocking it huge with their consoles. So Sega right now is just another game developer. And, and what other things from Sega do you know off the top of your head that they put out? Yakuza and Persona, both are really big, bigger in Japan than they are here. I mean, Persona is is actually that I would consider that to be fairly niche as well from your typical player base. Yeah. Yakuza, I think, is a lot more popular. I think Yakuza has a lot of movie potential. Agreed. Agreed. But it's going to be PG-13. Right. Right. That's a good point. That's a good point. (laughs) Yep. It's not going to be something that you can take your kids to and that your kids will beg to go see over and over and over again. But making it rated R, is that terrible? I mean, the games are are listed as mature, right? Aren't they? It would be because rated R movies always make a lot less money than PG-13. True. Very true. Yeah, especially in the box office. Right. And as we all know, creative decisions should be based on what will make you the most money. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck that quality shit. (laughs) We need the cash. (laughs) We need the cash. We need Chris Pratt to do the voices. Let's go. Give me the cash. All the voices. Uh. Make it like, you know, (laughs) Eddie Murphy in Coming to America. He's all the voices. (laughs) The the credits is just Chris Pratt, Chris Pratt, Chris Pratt, Chris Pratt. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Next up from Games Radar. The mathematical concept of Pi can now play Pokemon, but still can't find the first gym after 16,000 hours of trying. Pi, the number shown by the symbol Pi, has often been said to contain the complete works of Shakespeare within its infinitely flowing digits. Mathematicians still don't know if that's actually true, but after 759 days, one streamer has proven that Pi contains a 16,000-hour Pokemon Sapphire player that keeps getting stuck in the starting town. The theory goes that since Pi contains an infinite series of seemingly random digits, if you calculate it far enough, it should be seen to contain every possible sequence of numbers, including strings that would translate to the works of Shakespeare, your childhood diary, or a recipe for a really good apple pie. Even after calculating Pi to 100 trillion digits, mathematicians still can't prove that the distribution of numbers is truly random, so this idea does remain purely theoretical. Inspired by that theory, a Twitch channel called Winning Sequence started running Pi Plays Pokemon Sapphire in October 2021. Every digit between 0 and 9 is mapped to a button and fed into the game per each second, making the number in question automatically play the game, according to the channel description. As of this story, Pi Plays Pokemon Sapphire has run through nearly 62.3 million digits and still hasn't managed to leave the starting town. It's regularly gotten to the opening route, fighting enough random battles to get its septile up to level 77, and it's even made it up to Old Dale Town and Route 103 at least once, but it keeps getting stuck back in Little Root Town. That's not amazing progress, admittedly, but that septile will absolutely rock the starting gym if it ever gets a chance to fight. <laughs> That's not playing the game. <laughs> soft locking it. I don't know. This is... The nerdiness that I love. (laughs) I knew it. See, that's why I chose this article. I was like, Ryan will love Uh, this shit. Nerd alert. And and I love that it it took in the concept of infinity as well into this, you know, this idea that if if things are truly random, you will create. And in fact, every thought that you've ever had in your brain will somehow uh, show up in these numbers and these digits if if given Uh the right inputs. Yeah. Think about that. Because <laughs> it just showed up on the, the Pokemon thing. So there you go. This is hilarious to me. And the outcomes that they got the Sceptile up to level 77. Like That's a lot of battling. It reminds me of the guy who decided he was going to get to level 99 on all of his characters by just playing like the first uh, reactor in Final Fantasy 7. And it took him Ooh. hundreds <laughs> of hours to get there. 
who are these masochists who decide to do this kind of stuff? <laughs> right. The beauty of this is, though, is that it's the computer doing it for you, so you don't have to worry about that. But I thought I still find it funny that the game has not, or the that the numbers haven't equated to at least a little bit more progress than this. Which is funny because we've talked before about um, somebody who had their goldfish playing Pokemon, and the goldfish managed to beat the game. Yes, I remember <laughs> that. So the goldfish are smarter than Pi. <laughs> Told you math was dumb. Yeah, I, I wonder what else you could plug Pi into. That would be fun. A different game might yield, obviously, different results. So I, I wonder if this is going to become a thing. All of a sudden, all of these Twitch channels are going to pop up where it's, you know, Pi plays uh, Bubble Bath Babes or something like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> if Pi played Bubble Bath Babes, there would be a headline that said, Nerds still cannot see t- <laughs> it, it'll, it'll soft lock itself it'll never be able to see the movie. all right let's move on to our top three new releases all right first up is persona 5 tactica hey we we're just talking about huh. that. yeah right PS5, Xbox Series X and S, PS4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC. Persona 5 Tactica features an all-new story, the return of the fan-favorite characters and brand-new allies and foes. Join the group as they lead an emotional revolution in this thrilling combat adventure. Assemble a team of beloved heroes to fight oppressing armies in thrilling turn-based combat. Overthrow your enemies with powerful personas and assortment of weapons and wipe them out with style. Next up is The Last Faith on PS5, Xbox Series X and S, PS4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC. Often brutal, always empowering, The Last Faith is an unholy alliance of Metroidvania and Souls-like. Discover a formidable arsenal of melee weapons, arcane spells, and long-range firearms, allowing you to carve a path your own way. Nonlinear exploration is the core of The Last Faith. Gorgeous pixel art depicts an imposing gothic landscape. And last up, Super Mario RPG, out on the Switch. Set out on a classic Mario adventure. Enter or revisit a world of whimsy with Mario on a quest to repair Star Road and defeat the troublemaking Smithy Gang. Team up with a party of unlikely allies, like the monstrous Bowser and a mysterious doll named Gino, in a story-rich RPG packed with laughs and quirky characters. So, taking a look at these three, Donnie, what are you in for this week? Uh, kind of a tough choice. Um, I will say Persona 5, not going to be my cup of tea. I looked at the the art style, and just from it alone, I'm passing. Super Mario RPG, I've played it a little bit back in the day. I have the game. Never really took the time to sit down and pop it in and give it like a really good, uh, a really good try. Uh, but I'm willing to do so now that it's been remastered. The Last Faith looks pretty badass. It it almost looks like Dead Cells-ish. I love the artwork. The gameplay is the 2D side-scroller, but this is like, it looks 3D. Don't know about the soundtrack yet, but uh, right now it's kind of a toss-up between The Last Faith and Super Mario RPG. Very nice. Blue, what about you? So Persona 5 Tactica, I'm not really into Persona games, but a turn-based RPG, those can be a lot of fun. The Last Faith looks killer. It's very like Symphony of the Night-ish. It's like if Symphony of the Night was a Soulsborne game. Uh, I love the pixel art. The music sound, at least in the trailer, sounds nice and gothic-y. I love the visuals of it. This is a game I definitely want to get at some point. But of course, let's talk about what I actually pre-ordered for this week, which is, of course, the Super Mario RPG remake. One of the bonuses of the game is that it was the original composer on the game was Yoko Shimomura, and she is coming back for the remaster. So that is very cool. This is a game that I'm looking forward to sitting down and going all the way through and can't wait till it gets here. Very cool. So what about you, Ryan? Uh, so Persona, I I don't know. that it, For some reason or another, I've just never really fallen in love with those games. And I think some of it is the art style, the, the like anime kind of look to it. Uh, somehow has always turned me off to Persona games. So probably not going to go with that one for this week. Um, Super Mario RPG. 
I have tried so many times to get into that game. And for one reason or yeah, another, yeah, it just yeah. doesn't <laughs> capture me. And I think a lot of it is just that it's it seems... I don't know, like how Final Fantasy Mystic Quest was like a beginner's RPG. It feels a lot like that. Even though it's not, there are definitely some challenging elements to it. But I've probably put, probably gotten six or seven hours into the game a few times. And it just, I'd never find myself going, oh, well, you know what? I got to get back into this. It just doesn't capture me for one reason or another. I know that's a hot take. I know a lot of people love, absolutely <laughs> love this game, <laughs> which leads to Last Faith. It looks bad ass. It really does. But two strikes against it, right? Mm-hmm. Metroidvania and Souls-like. Two game styles or genres that I suck at. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe this is the one that like actually gets me into these t- style of games, maybe. And if it's like Symphony of Night, I actually really enjoy Symphony of Night. So if it's like that, then sure. I'll give it a try. I don't know what it is that makes Symphony of the Night different than most Metroidvanias I've played, but for some reason, I just really enjoy it. So maybe this is the the the, the time. And you know what? Then I'll finally start playing Bloodborne to make Clayman 71 <laughs> happy. <laughs> I'll jump into Hollow Knight to make everyone in the freaking Discord happy. And you know what? I'll be a convert because of The Last Faith. We'll see. No, no. What's really going to happen is he's going to pick it up and play it for 10 minutes and then put it down and he'll have none of these. Probably. Yeah. That, Probably. That's, yeah. That sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully the game was a gift and he didn't spend <laughs> full price on it. All right, let's move on to our main topic for the night. From Gamerant, the Game Awards 2023 nominees announced. Jeff Keighley has officially announced the Game Awards 2023 nominees for every category that will be featured at the big event. The Game Awards 2023 will take place on Thursday, December 7th, and we'll see this year's biggest games recognized for their accomplishments across a variety of categories. Millions of gamers will be tuning in to see which games win which awards at the Game Awards 2023. But that's not the only reason to watch the event. As usual, the Game Awards 2023 will be home to huge announcements and world premiere trailers, giving fans a look at the future of the gaming industry as they look back at what has been an incredible year for new video game releases. It will be exciting to see which game wins in each category, but it's safe to say that most are interested in which game will take home the coveted Game of the Year prize. There are six games nominated for Game of the Year at the Game Awards this year. Out of these, two games stand out as the most likely to take home the top prize, and not Starfield. The most likely scenario is that either Baldur's (laughs) Gate 3 or The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom will win Game of the Year at the Game Awards 2023. They are the two highest rated new game releases of 2023, earning widespread critical acclaim and being hailed as absolute landmark releases. Both games took the world by storm when they launched earlier this year, and while it's possible the Game of the Year winner will be a surprise, smart money is on Baldur's Gate 3 or Tears of the Kingdom. All right, like we did last year, let's go through the nomination categories and make our predictions. So first up, Game of the Year. Alan Wake, Baldur's Gate 3, Marvel's Spider-Man 2, Resident Evil 4, Super Mario Bros. Wonder, and Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Ryan, what's your choice? I'm going to go with Baldur's Gate 3. I think nobody expected Baldur's Gate to come out of the gate and be so awesome. I think that there's that like element of surprise that came along with it. Granted, the beta was out for a little while, but damn, that that has been a huge hit with people. So Baldur's Gate 3 gets mine. Donnie? Just for the customization alone, I'm going to say Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, Tears of the Kingdom, it's a build on what um, Breath of the Wild was. So does that necessarily negate the fact that it could be a, a game of the year? No, but... Uh, my bet is more along the lines of Baldur's Gate 3. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to say Baldur's Gate 3. I'm going to go ahead and say it's Alan Wake 2. Okay. That's not a bad guess. Yeah, okay, I'll go ahead and address the 800-pound gorilla in the room. <laughs> Starfield's not on the list. And that was my that was my big prediction for 2023, was that Starfield would be game of the year, and it's not even on the list. <laughs> In my defense in January, did we know we were going to have a lineup like this? 
I, I got to be honest with you, though. Hearing you say I was wrong, I'm probably going to take that recording and uh, play it over and over again. It's going to become <laughs> my ringtone. <laughs> it's going to be part of my Twitch channel. Yes. Well, yeah. Like I like I mentioned in the Discord, I'm not used to being wrong like you two are. So this is new for me. So <laughs> I don't say that often, which is why you're taking the time to point it out. And it means so much wow. to you. So you know what? I'm going to take this and turn it into a compliment for myself. That's all right. I'm touching myself tonight to that song. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate I your I honesty. I was <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So as far as what I, I'm going to pick for this year, for the record, I do think Baldur's Gate 3 is going to win. Uh, for the the main simple fact is that you can play it and it's one of those RPGs where you pretty much can be whoever you want. You can do whatever you want. You can f*** whoever you want. Or whatever you want. Or, or, or a bear. whatever you want. <laughs> I, I think it's that that kind of game that draws you in and demands replayability. So you say, what if I did this instead? What if I did this instead? And while... Tears of the Kingdom offers that kind of sandbox aspect with the building. I don't think it's as compelling as the kind of sandbox storytelling that you can get in Baldur's Gate. So for the record, I do think Baldur's Gate will win. My personal choice is Tears of the Kingdom. I would like her comments stricken from the record because what she's going to do is when Baldur Gates 3 wins, she's going to be like, well, I did say that it was going to win. <laughs> so, <laughs> Am sorry, I not, not allowed a caveat? I do think it's going to win. But my my vote goes to Tears of the Kingdom. I'm just saying you're going to get out of this when Baldur's Gate 3 wins and you're just going to be able to like, well, it's, it, uh, technically I get half a point for this one. <laughs> <laughs> is it, you mean like you did last year? Uh, <laughs> Don't use my logic against me. <laughs> Let's go on record by saying there are no half points. Are we all agreeing there's no half points? Ryan? I'll uh, have my secretary get back to you. Okay. Because <laughs> I mean, it's a fair point because last year, the correct guess was always either God of War or Elden Ring. So it was, it was fairly easy to guess. This yeah. year, it's it's not nearly that simple. Agreed. All right, next up is Best Narrative, Alan Wake 2. I think you're saying that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Baldur's Gate 3, Cyberpunk 2077, Phantom Liberty, Final Fantasy 16, and Marvel's Spider-Man 2. So, Donnie, what are you going with? Uh, does it take the one-two punch? Game of the Year, Alan Wake 2, and Best Narrative with Alan Wake 2? Ooh. <sighs> I don't know. To compound on what Blue's does, she, Blue makes a compelling argument for Baldur's Gate 3 as to what you can do in the replayability. I think maybe I go with Baldur's Gate 3 as best narrative. Solid choice. Blue, what about you? Well, I think because of what I said, I'm going to not go with Baldur's Gate 3 for best <laughs> narrative. <laughs> because I think Alan Wake is probably the kind of game that has spent a lot more time making a really tight, really compelling narrative, as opposed to Baldur's Gate 3, which has spent a lot of time trying to give you freedom to create your own narrative. So my vote's going Alan Wake 2. Interesting. So I've had some inside information about Alan Wake 2, and supposedly half of the game is super boring. So, oh no! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but your choice is already locked in. So, gotcha. <laughs> I'm gonna go with the game that revitalized a dying game that was mired with troubles from the beginning, and it now is establishing a really strong player base. So, I'm gonna go with Cyberpunk 2077: Phantom Liberty. Okay, so. I want to make a actually moment actually because <laughs> Cyberpunk 2077 Phantom Livery it's not a game it's an expansion. Uh, and you're not wrong, but um, it's it's listed as one of the choices. <laughs> so. I, I do see that. I realize you didn't put it there. But I'm, it it seems weird to me because it's not a game, it's an expansion. I'm going to take your thoughts into consideration and still stick with Cyberpunk 2077 Phantom Liberty for my choice. <laughs> Next up is Best Art Direction, Alan Wake 2, seeing a pattern here, Hi-Fi Rush, Lies of P, Super Mario Brothers Wonder, and The Legend of Zelda, Tears of the Kingdom. 
Blue, which one is your choice? Uh, I don't think it's going to be Legend of Zelda, Tears of the Kingdom. Because it's a clone copy of <laughs> yes, Breath of the Wild. That's, <laughs> wild. that's what I'm saying. And, and actually, I don't know if Breath of the Wild won Best Art Direction back in its year or not. I would have to look that up. But I think you could make an argument for any of the remaining four. Mm-hmm. And I guess the question is, are they going to vote for something that's dark and moody like Alan Wake 2? Are they going to vote for something that's loud and bonkers like Super Mario Brothers Wonder? Or do they like the Bell Epoch steampunk or do they want something that's cartoony or comic booky or whatever? Mm, having to pick one, I'm going to pick Hi-Fi Rush. Interesting. Okay, yeah, good choice. choice. Yeah. Kind of the beautiful Joe look, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I would. Uh, and so Jack I'm, Ryan Radio. Right. Oh, there. The, excellent, excellent point, sir. Yep. Um, so I'm stuck between Hi Fi Rush and Lies of P. Both of them are stunning looking games, absolutely gorgeous. And the one thing that those two games in particular, the art adds to the environment so well. But I think what I'm going to go with is Liza P on this one. Okay. Um, more on a personal choice because I like Liza P's art direction a little bit better than High Fry Rush. So that's uh, yeah, it's a little selfish, but uh, going to go with that one. <laughs> so uh, before Donnie gives his choice, I looked up the best art direction from 2017 Game Awards. And Breath of the Wild was not even nominated. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> The winner was Cuphead, which is an indie game. Really? So, yeah, that kind of lends to my argument is maybe maybe Best Art Direction is one of those awards that they use to throw a bone to a smaller game, like Hi-Fi Rush. Hmm. Okay. Based on what you just said, makes me think that Super Mario Brothers Wonder is probably not going to to make it. I love the art style of Super Mario Brothers Wonder. It's it's vibrant. It is just full of life. It is not so much different than like a Super Mario Brothers Odyssey or uh, Super Mario 3D World. I, it just it feels like those games, just a little bit more polished. I would love to say that Alan Wake 2, uh, Hi-Fi Rush or Liza P would definitely win it. <sighs> That's a very good choice with Hi-Fi Rush. I think I'm going to go with Alan Wake 2. All right. Well, choice. Because the art looks just completely amazing and the, the settings and environments and everything like that look like straight out of a freaking movie. All right. Next up is best score in music. Nominees are Alan Wake 2, Baldur's Gate 3, Final Fantasy 16, Hi-Fi Rush and Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Donnie, what do you want? Uh, this one, I'll actually go with Hi-Fi Rush. That was easy. It was easy. I just I think it's probably going to have some some very intense dynamic music that gets you like really amped up and everything. I haven't listened to any of these games. I, so I, I can't really I'm, I'm not going by experience. It's just like by kind of instinct, I guess. <laughs> I like it. Bold choice, Cotton. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Ryan? I'm also going to go with High Fry Rush. I love the like the rock soundtrack that is available through that game. I think it's really well done. To me, that makes it unique compared to the rest of these games. Uh, it's it's the and I hate to use this term, but redheaded stepchild. Sorry, um, <laughs> I am offended. I, am I know, so offended. I know, I know. I just couldn't think of a different version of that. <laughs> Maybe black sheep. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but nonetheless, the idea is that with it being such a unique soundtrack, I think that it would probably, to me at least, uh, deserve more praise than than some of the other stuff. What was what was the one last year with the rhythm based shooter with the rocks the metal soundtrack? Oh, Hells, um, metal Hellslinger. Metal Hellslinger. Yes, because that was one I think you guys both wanted to win best score in music and didn't. I, I do remember flat. this. I was I'm yeah. jaded. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, based on that logic, well, I think your your argument for Hi Fi Rush is good. Based on the previous logic, I'm going to say no, not Hi Fi Rush. <sighs> See, the, here's the thing. Here's where I would normally vote Final Fantasy 16 
without question, because that's always been the thing that you could count on with a Final Fantasy game is that the music would be incredible. But Nubo Uematsu was not involved. Yoko Shimamura, she did 15, but she wasn't involved in 16. And the 30 hours that I played of Final Fantasy 16, that was one of the biggest heartbreaks was like the music. I don't remember it. It was just kind of bland and in the background and completely forgettable. Hmm. So... All that bunny trail to say, not Final Fantasy 16. <laughs> I'm going to go Baldur's Gate 3. Safe choice. It, it is a safe choice, I admit. I'll take it, though. <laughs> Next up is best performance. Ben Starr is Clive from Final Fantasy 16. Cameron Monaghan as Cal Kestis from Star Wars Jedi Cal Survivor. Kestis. Yeah, Cal Kestis. You put too much effort into that. <laughs> <sighs> Idris, Al- Castisa? <laughs> <laughs> Idris Elba as Solomon Reed from Cyberpunk 2077 Phantom Liberty. Melanie LeBird as Saga Anderson from Alan Wake 2. Neil Newbon as Asterian from Baldur's Gate 3. And Yuri Lowenthal as Peter Parker in Marvel's Spider-Man 2. So Blue, what are you going with? I think for me, it comes down to either Melanie Libbard as Saga Anderson in Alloway 2 or Neil Newbon as Asterian in Baldur's Gate 3. Asterian is such a beloved character, especially like in the online crowds and, and discussion boards. I could see him winning like the popular choice. But once again, as we all know with the Game Awards, what the gamers think has nothing to do with it. It's all right. what the journalists think. And I think the journalists will want to pick Melanie Liebert from Alan Wake 2. Donnie, what about you? Eh, the only two people that I really know of here are Cameron Monaghan and Idris Elba. So I, I don't really know any of the other people. Don't know any of the characters except for you know Peter Parker. So just based on this alone, I'm going to say Cameron Monaghan? <laughs> Question mark? I, I run, run Burgundy. 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 Exactly. I, uh, <laughs> Ryan, what about you? I think what they're going to do is they're going to vote in the celebrity this time around. Um, You think so? I do. I think what they want to do is to bring in more eyes to this because what they'll do is all of a sudden it'll hit CNN and Fox News and everything in the morning. Idris Elba, best performance of the year at the Game Awards. So that's why I'm going to go with Idris. Not because I necessarily think he did the best, but I think that it's (laughs) going to win. I mean, I guess I could see... It being like this kind of strategy where if you wanted celebrities to actually show up to your awards show, you should just start giving them awards. There you go. That works. Everybody wins. (laughs) (laughs) Question mark. (laughs) And last, but certainly not least, best independent game. We have Cocoon, Dave the Diver, Dredge, Sea of Stars, and Viewfinder. Ryan, which one are you picking? I think I'm going to go with the one that I think a lot of people would have potentially put in Game of the Year because it's been so widely talked about and so widely loved. And I'm also surprised it's not there for Best Art Direction. But again, I think they're probably looking for more AAA games in there. So I'm going to go with Sea of Stars on this one. Okay. Interesting choice. (laughs) <laughs> is it? <laughs> I think Sea of Stars has the pedigree. I think that's what a lot of people will immediately think of. But I think the sleeper hit of the year is actually Dave the Diver. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I hear so many people absolutely love that game about how fun it is. And how it's been out for a long time and people are still playing it like crazy. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to vote Dave the Diver. Very nice. Damn you, Scooby Steve. <laughs> and Scuba Steve says to eat your vegetables. <laughs> um, a lot of good games on this list. I will not vote for Sea of Stars just because to me it seems just like a regular run of the mill RPG. Viewfinder looks amazing. Dave the Diver looks very fun. And it's a game I've had on my radar for a while. Just haven't had a chance to go out and pick it up. It's one that I do want to pick up and play. That is probably going to be my pick. Although, like, Viewfinder is right there, right there on the edge of, of being my pick, too. So, but because of that, I'm going to I'm gonna go ahead and say Dave the Diver. All right. So, uh, in a couple of weeks, we will review these and we'll see who wins. Are you tallying the votes? Yeah, I'll tally them. Don't you worry. Okay. I'll keep okay. track. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you always keep the receipts. That's I what always what keep am the I receipts. Saying? What am I saying here?
All right, before we move on, let's take a quick break to talk about our sponsor. This segment is proudly sponsored by A Gamer Looks at 40 podcast. The show explores the history of video games through the stories and experiences of the people who lived it. Join host Bill Tucker along with a rotating cast of friends, family, podcasters, journalists, and anybody with a story to tell as they go beyond the bits and bytes to share personal recollections of the last 30 years of gaming. This week's question is, what video game location would have the most interesting museums? Let Bill know your answer by sending him a tweet at a gamer looks at 40 on Twitter. I'm going to say that a museum in Silent Hill Ooh. would be interesting. Very nice. Okay. You could have all kinds of displays for different lore, the history of Silent Hill, the different monsters could all be represented. You could also have like a in memoriam of characters who have died there. And uh, when you got to the end of the in memoriam display, it would just be a mirror because you're never actually leaving the museum. You're now Ooh, part of the exhibits. That gave me the chills. Yeah, that's very you're welcome. Very nice answer. Konami, call me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fellow kids, make sure your Beanie Babies are stashed away, you have enough N64 controllers for your sleepover, and you got your bop it back from your friend's house, because where we're going, you're going to need them. This is the Retro Rewind for November 1996. Let's take a look at some of the top Billboard songs and their artists for this month. No Diggity from Black Street. It's All Coming Back to Me Now by Celine Dion. There were the nights when the wind was so cold. Fuck, I hate that song. Oh. <laughs> How can you hate Don't Celine you Dion? dare talk bad about Celine Dion. <laughs> I didn't say anything bad about Celine Dion. I said I hated the song that was played <laughs> ad nauseum on the radio. Radio destroys songs. Yes, they do. Whispers in the morning. Uh, Unbreak My Heart by Tony Braxton. Mouth by Meryl Bainbridge. And if you don't remember this one, I don't blame you. I actually had to look this one up too, but when I first heard it, like the first couple of notes, I was like, oh, that one, of course. When I kiss your mouth, I want to taste it. Turn you upside down, don't want to waste it. What does that even mean? <laughs> If you have to ask, buddy, you can't afford yeah. it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I spent like a good 10 minutes trying to analyze that lyric. I was like, you know what? Just moving on, moving on. No, no, that's the kind of thing you you sang like between classes in the high school hallway and anybody who asked questions about it, you just went, virgin. <laughs> <laughs> You've never experienced the love of a lover loving you. <laughs> Nobody by Keith Sweat. Great song. Pony by Genuine, a very nice club hit. <laughs> uh, my brain was trying to say something else there. Yeah. <laughs> Good save. Good save. Yeah. <laughs> I Love You Always Forever by Donna Stewart. Do you guys know that one? I yep. love you always forever. Dead. Near and far. Yes. <laughs> That's a prom candidate for the Peter Griffin cover album. <laughs> And when I first, I was like, I love you always forever. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, how is that even a sentence? But then again, the first couple of notes, I was like, yep, there it is. Where do you go by no mercy? Where do you go? My lovely. lovely. Oh, oh, oh. The Macarena by Los Del Rio. Oh, my God. Yeah. The Macarena. I won a Macarena contest once. <laughs> what? Go on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm listening. It was at uh, Cosmic Bowling. There was a Macarena contest, and if you won the contest, you got your next game free. I was like, hell yeah, I want a free game of Cosmic Bowling, so I won. I'm going to need to see some video. No. <laughs> Fortunately, on, this was way before a cell phone camera. Oh, I was about to say, it sounds like the way you said that, that there is video of that. No, 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 no. <laughs> like, no. Hot on TV, uh, The X-Files, Caroline in the City, Grace Under Fryer, New York PD Blue, or 
NYPD Blue. I almost said Grace Under Fryer. I like, thought that's what you did like, say. <laughs> like, that's a whole different show, one that shouldn't be on TV. Uh, Mad About You, Fraser, Fraser, Drew Carey Show, Walker, Texas Ranger, Home Improvement, Friends, Suddenly Susan, Seinfeld, and ER. Hot of the theaters this month was Ransom, Space Jam. Eh? Eh? Oh my God, Space Jam. You don't remember Mar- Ransom? Not really. With Mel Gibson, his yeah, son gets kidnapped Mel Gibson by Gary yeah. Sinise. Yeah. Uh, all right, yeah. Nope. Star Trek First Contact, Romeo and Juliet. Great oh, soundtrack. God. Oh, but the uh, DiCaprio. Yes, DiCaprio and... Claire Danes. I'll there you go. still my 15-year-old heart. <laughs> <laughs> the mirror has two faces. Of course, that's why it's a mirror. Uh, set it off. 101 Dalmatians, Jingle All the Way, High School High, and Sleepers. If you've never seen Sleepers, I highly recommend it. Great movie. In the news, the Spice Girls released their debut album, Spice, (laughs) and subsequently (laughs) awakened the libido of millions of people. Bill Clinton is reelected as president of the United States, ensuring more stains on more blouses for four more years. (laughs) Sonny Bono is reelected to Congress, and the amount of entertainers running our country is too damn high. (laughs) (laughs) Evander Holyfield beats Iron Mike Tyson to regain the WBA championship, and I guess Tyson wasn't as hungry enough for Holyfield's ear in this bout. (laughs) And after 24 years, Disneyland's Main Street Electrical Parade ends. Someone unplugged it. Hot at the Arcades was Red Earth, Street Fighter EX, X-Men vs. Street Fighter, War Gods, Tekken 2, Mace the Dark Age, Die Hard Arcade, Cruisin' World, Batman Forever, the arcade game, obviously, and Virtua (laughs) Fighter 3. I think if I was walking into an arcade, Batman Forever is not where I would go be dropping (laughs) my quarters. That sounds a little space ballish, doesn't it? How did the arcades? Is Batman Forever the arcade game? <laughs> and let's take a look at an article from the readers. Are coin ops a dying breed with super systems being released? It looks as if we finally made it. The N64 is finally here, and the M2 and Sega's 64 bit system are on the horizon. It seems we are in full swing in the super machine era. My question is where does the future of coin ops stand? I used to like to stop by the arcade every now and then to play the same games I had at home for my Super NES. The quarter munchers were bigger and better. It was worth the buck for the experience. However, we now have home versions of our favorite games that look and sound as good as the coin op. And, correct me if I'm wrong, it seems to me that the time span from when a new release hits the arcade to the time when it is released for home consoles is growing shorter all the time. By the time this letter is printed, I will have my new N64 pumping through a 27-inch stereo TV. Ooh. <laughs> pumping. So many inches. <laughs> <laughs> There's 27 of them. Where is my motivation to go back to the arcades? You make a very good point, Michael Seville. The arcades are dead. The, yeah. the only thing arcades are good for right now are uh, ticket tickets for kids to keep them busy they're not arcades they're amusement centers that's very well said i do like this concept though of the super system is that like sega's super game (laughs) it will be (laughs) yeah (laughs) according to everything i know about it (laughs) (laughs) right which is a lot (laughs) all right let's take a look at some of the games that were released this month and When I say my God, I mean my God. This was a banging month for games for the PlayStation 1, and let's just get right into it. You have Tomb Raider, Ark the Lad 2, Blood Omen Legacy of Cain, Bubsy 3D. (laughs) (laughs) Let's let's take that one out. Crash Bandicoot, NHL Open Ice 2 on 2 Challenge, Star Wars Dark Forces, and Twisted Metal, all coming out this month for the PlayStation. Wow. Wow. Damn. Which one were you spending your allowance on? Oh, um, I did buy Tomb Raider when I first bought my PlayStation. 
And that game was amazing, but probably I would spend my allowance on Twisted Metal. Back then, I would have spent it on NHL Open Ice um, because the Ah, arcade was so fun. Yes, it was. I don't remember if the PS1 game was any good, though. What about you, Blue? Which one are you picking? We had a a PlayStation in our house. Somebody we knew left a PlayStation in our house for a few months, and they left a demo of Tomb Raider. And I really, really wanted to play the full game, but never owned a PlayStation until I grew up, so... Probably if I had an allowance back then, that's what I would have done with it. For the Saturn, we had Dark Savior, Dragon Force, Earthworm Jim 2, and Virtual Cop 2. For the PC was Diablo. For the Super Nintendo, yes, 1996 Super Nintendo, Donkey Kong Country 3. Nice. Well, no, wait, 3. No, 3 sucked. Oh, (laughs) way to backtrack there. (laughs) Never mind. Continue, (laughs) Continue on. (laughs) <laughs> For the N64, we have Killer Instinct Gold and Wayne Gretzky's 3D Hockey. Okay, kids, thanks for hanging out with me this evening. This concludes our retro rewind for this month. I gotta go. I've got a date tonight. We're supposed to be blockbusting and chilling. At least that's what he said. <laughs> the only thing I'll be busting is this box of M&Ms that we can share <laughs> while watching this movie. Right. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and wrap up the show. Thank you for listening to episode 98 of Gamers Week Podcast and a big thank you to the Retro Game Club Podcast, Love Retro BTW, and a Gamer Looks at 40 Podcast for sponsoring this episode. Don't forget to check out their links in the show notes. If you want to connect with Gamers Week, follow us on Twitter at Gamers Week PC. Email us at gamersweekpodcast at gmail.com. Visit our merch store at gamers-week-podcast.creator-spring.com. Or if you want to do it the easy way, follow the link in the show notes. Join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gamersweek. And finally, since you made it all the way to the end of this episode, please leave us a rating and a review to let us know how we did. We really do value your feedback. And while you're there, consider subscribing on iTunes, Spotify, or your podcast platform of choice. And of course, don't forget, next week no new episode due to thanksgiving but we hope you all have a wonderful holiday (laughs) what the hell turkey (laughs) (laughs) that scared me man i was like (laughs) (laughs) well done sir (laughs) i'm a man of many talents (laughs) no talent that anyone asked for but sure right (laughs) What are they going to reap the benefits of this? I probably never. (laughs) All right. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night. Aren't you a little old for video games? Welcome to Gamers Week Uncut. Welcome to Gamers Week Uncut. Welcome to Gamers Week Uncut, patrons with benefits. This is the unscripted patron-only bonus cast with less editing and more dirty jokes. We don't know where the conversation will go, but we're sure it will be weird. This fish just went right on my nipple. And I'm just like... (laughs) (laughs) I Google Street Fighter 6, the first search result that comes up is people think they can see Ryu's dick in the Street Fighter 6 reveal. <laughs> Listen up here, kids. You're not going to want to get one of those VD STDs things, right? Make your dick fall off. When you go, grab a pro. You'll be doing it for America. That was perfect. <laughs> If you want to hear weekly episodes of our patron-only bonus cast, join us at patreon.com slash gamersweek. 